Thanks, Chris. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and you all for being here to hear my talk. Um, it's a real honor to be here. And I just want to emphasize, like Chris said, we're now moving back to the metastatic space. Um, we're talking about frontline therapy. Some of the other speakers in subsequent talks will talk about second line therapy. I'm emphasizing clear cell RCC. Um, some of the later speakers will talk about non clear cell RCC. And I'm emphasizing what is now FDA approved and available here on September 22nd, 2018. So there's, as we all know, there are a lot of exciting therapies and trials and subsequent speakers will focus on those. These are my disclosures. And I want to ground our talk by just starting to show you the NCCN guidelines. And the NCCN guidelines have really evolved over the past several years um, as I've been involved with them. Um, to This is the most recent version, actually, that's hot off the press in the last couple of weeks to, to emphasize more prognostic risk factors. Um, and this is something that Dr. Singer and other speakers have focused a little bit on. But if you start at the top here on the green arrow, you can see that, again, we're talking about the relapsed or metastatic first-line clear cell patient, that the patient with favorable risk, uh, they list two options, pazopinib and sunitinib. They list those both as category one. And I want to emphasize again that the NCCN guidelines have started putting things like category one, preferred. I'm listing uh, below there what, what constitutes category one. Essentially, you could think of category one as a phase three trial or, or even multiple phase three trials. Category two um, starts to be things like phase two trials or instances where there's you know, inconsistent data. Um, and then the distinction between A and B is really if there's less, uh, less consistent data. For example, as Dr. Haas talked about in the adjuvant space where you have one positive trial and three negative trials, there's you know, a little bit of a, a discrepancy. So now if you move from the preferred regimens column to the right, you see there are also other recommended regimens. Um, ipilimumab, nivolumab could be reasonable for that favorable risk patient. Cabozantinib listed as category 2B. And then there are also other options as well to the right of that, such as active surveillance. If you go down one notch to the poor intermediate risk group, they list essentially two options that are preferred regimens, either ipilimumab, nivolumab as category 1 or cabozantinib um, as uh, category 2A, then there are also other, other options as well. So now you might just think your oncologist could look at this grid and just pick off the grid. Um, and if it were that easy, I could just drop the mic and walk off the stage. Um, but as we all know, you know, for the individual patients sitting in front of us as clinicians, everyone is different. Everyone has different preferences and, and so on, different comorbidities. And, and so I want to present to you a little bit more of a nuanced view. So I'm going to answer this question, what is the best frontline therapy for metastatic RCC that's clear cell component in 2018? I'm going to say it depends. And I have two daughters. They're four and seven. So I have become an aficionado of children's books. And the, the best kind of metaphor for it depends that I've seen recently comes from this book called Duck Rabbit. And so you see this figure or, or picture at the bottom. If you look at it from one angle, it looks like a duck. From the other angle, it looks like a rabbit. And I would submit to you it's a little bit that way when choosing the frontline therapy for the patient sitting in, in front of you as a clinician, in that you know, everybody's coming at this from a different angle. Some people are going to see the duck. Some people are going to see the rabbit. So there's really no one right answer across the board. So I'm showing you, though, what are the things that go through my mind. And these are the top kind of three things. There are other factors, of course, that go into this tough decision. Um, but I think about, first, I'm assuming that they've seen urologists um, like Dr. Margulis, um, Dr. Singer. They've, we've thought about things like cytoreductive nephrectomy, things, you know, other local therapies. Dr. Spies thought about metasusectomy. We're, we're past that part. But I think to myself, does this patient even need systemic therapy? And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, I also think about prognostic factors as outlined in those NCCN guidelines. But I also think about the patient's disease burden uh, in terms of their pace of disease, in terms of their volume of disease, and in terms of whether they're having symptoms from their disease. I also take into account patient goals. Um, you know, as, as a young oncologist, 
I thought every patient's goal would be to cure their cancer no matter what, but if you, if you talk to patients, and the more and more I talk to patients, everyone's goals are a little bit nuanced, and you don't know what they are unless you ask, so it's important to do that. I'll talk a little bit about that. Then there are also some kind of technicalities, which are contraindications. It may be that a certain therapy is just not safe or, or, an, or patient is just not fit for a certain therapy. So going and touching on this first question, does the patient even need systemic therapy? And there's emerging evidence that not every patient who is diagnosed with metastatic clear cell RCC needs at least immediate systemic therapy. So on the left panel is, is showing you the first prospective series. This is Dr. Rennie's group who showed that um, patients who are prospectively enrolled and who got active surveillance did very well. This curve is showing you the proportion of patients over time um, and how they kind of decline. And you can see, though, that they're a sizable proportion of patients 24 months out, two years out, three years out, and so on. Our series is shown on the right. This is from the prospective MARC observational study. Um, Dr. Rennie's uh, number of patients was about 50. We had around 170 patients who were, again, diagnosed with metastatic disease, but in whom systemic therapy was deferred. And this curve is showing you the fraction of patients on that deferred systemic therapy, so meaning they had not gotten systemic therapy uh, over time. And you can see that as the data cut off, about two-thirds of the patients who initially were selected for that deferred approach were still not receiving systemic therapy. And furthermore, that was about a quarter of all of the patients, which were 500 patients in the overall observational study. So um, this is again now listed in the NCCN guidelines as useful under certain circumstances. So what about prognostic factors? This has been covered by Dr. Singer and others, but I just want to reiterate this just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, RCC is a heterogeneous tumor. As this uh, panel on the left show, shows, um, it's heterogeneous from patient to patient. Uh, within patients, tumors may be heterogeneous, and even within specific tumors, there may be heterogeneous components. And of course, RCC is heterogeneous at a genetic level. But on the right, we're really focusing on that patient-to-patient -patient variability. And this, is, this, this curve on the right, these curves on the right are showing the IMDC, or sometimes known as the HANG prognostic model. And as you can see, um, according to whether the patient has a favorable, intermediate, and poor risk, there are different proportions of patients alive at 24 months. And there are basically six factors that we take into account, two clinical factors, four lab factors. The two clinical factors are the time from when the patient was diagnosed with RCC, whether it's metastatic or not, to when the patient needs systemic therapy for metastatic disease, according to whether that's less than or greater than one year. The patient's Karnofsky performance status, which Dr. Uh, Singer covered, uh, whether that's less than uh, 80 or 80 or greater. And then the laboratory factors being a high corrected calcium, a low hemoglobin, a high neutrophil count or a high platelet count, all of those being risk factors. Essentially, you add them up and you can, you can uh, dichotomize patients. And, and the most important categorizations are really, is the patient favorable risk or is the patient intermediate or poor risk? So moving on to disease burden. This is, this is something that, uh, you know, I've combed the literature. It's not that well described. They did attempt to describe disease burden in that Rennie series by looking at the sum of the lesions, so the longest you know, diameter of, of all of the lesions, and so kind of categorizing patients on, on uh, that basis. But I think in reality, oncologists, th this is more of a gestalt. You kind of put your finger up in the air, um, and you, you look at you know, scans to see how fast the patient's disease is progressing. You look at things like you know, is there, you know, is there one lesion or a couple of lesions? Is it only in one organ? Is it in multiple organ sites? And you kind of take all of this into account. I think another important thing to take into account is, is the patient symptomatic from RCC? And this cartoon here shows, uh, you know, different symptoms that a patient might experience from RCC. So the next, and I think one of the most important things, is talking about the patient's goals. So these are some possible goals. So thinking about cure, which would, you know, we would describe as a complete response that's durable. 
Thinking about living longer, that would be improved survival. Thinking about living better, that would be having a good quality of life or an improvement in quality of life. So I just put one of the questions that I ask patients, so, and I think this can kind of flesh a lot of things out. What are you willing to risk now to achieve one or a combination of these goals in the future? And you know, I think I, I always come in with a certain bias based on what I've read in the patient's chart, and I'm always surprised what, what individual patients say. So it's, I think it's very important to actually ask the question. The third I mention is just contraindications, and I'm giving you a few examples here. You know, is there a contraindication to immuno-oncology therapy, specifically immune checkpoint inhibitors? So examples would be, does the patient have an autoimmune disease, and what is that autoimmune disease? Not all autoimmune diseases are, are created equal. Um, Conversely, is there a contraindication of TKI therapy, like sunitinib, pazopinib, or cabozantinib? Maybe the patient has a decreased heart function. Maybe the patient has uncontrolled high blood pressure. Possibly they're, you know, the patient is at risk for bleeding. Maybe the patient is on um, one of the new blood thinners for atrial fibrillation. Uh, is the patient at risk for poor wound healing? Maybe they've undergone a cytoreductive nephrectomy recently uh, or an metastasectomy. And then thinking about how serious are these contraindications, there are certain things that, that definitely worry you, but they might not be a, a, a deal breaker. Those would be relative contraindications. There are things that are absolute contraindications that you know, we definitely cannot go forward because it's just not safe. So before I get into the specific trials, and I'm going to cover two, I just want to review how the different therapies work. And other speakers have, have discussed this, but I just want to give you a little bit of my take here. So on the left, this is showing you how the, the VEGF receptor TKIs work. And again, I'm going to focus on sunitinib, pazopinib, and cabozantinib. But it's showing you, if I can get my pointer to work, it's showing you right here on the left, as has been mentioned earlier in this meeting, that one of the seminal kind of problems with clear cell RCC is an inactivated or mutated von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor, and that leads to all these downstream effects that result in increased angiogenesis. These targeted therapies, or TKIs as we call them, block those receptor kinases and essentially block the consequences of that. Another way to think about this is the gas versus brake pedal analogy, which I really like. So thinking about the, if I can get my pointer to work here, um, thinking about what's going on in clear cell RCC is a little bit like this bottom right panel where the brakes are out because the tumor suppressor is inactivated. And essentially we're blocking the consequences of that with these targeted therapies. I also am going to talk about ipilimumab and nivolumab, which are two um, immuno-oncology agents. You may know ipilimumab by the trade name Yervoy or nivolumab, as Dr. Haas said, by the trade name Opdivo, but I'm going to refer to them in this talk as ipinevo in combination. Um, so what, what this slide is showing you here on the left is how your immune system recognizes and fights cancer. And this, this kind of a wheel is called the cancer immunity cycle. Um, and so what it's showing you is that your immune system reaction to cancer is really taking place both over space and time. So as you start here with number one, um, as cancer cells die or are killed, they're releasing cancer, cancer antigens that is into the bloodstream. Um, that's causing those cancer, cancer antigens to be presented to the immune system and for T cells to be activated. One analogy you can think about this is, is that the, this occurs in the lymph node, which is like the police station where the, the police, which are the T cells, live. Those T cells then have to traffic through the vasculature to the tumor. You can think about the, the, the policeman as getting into their cars and driving to the scene of the crime. Um, and then the policeman then uh, arresting or, or, uh, or killing the tumor. So specifically then, what ipilimumab on the left of the rightmost panel here does and what nivolumab does is that ipilimumab creates more cars coming from the police station, so more police get to the scene of the crime, and then nivolumab actually activates the policemen at the scene of the crime. So maybe the, maybe the police are kind of letting a lot of crimes happen under their nose, but they suddenly wake up and, and see what's going on. So um, this is an analogy I like. Um, so to show you the, uh, just to show you the historical context here, 
Sunitinib, which is a VEGF receptor TKI again, was really the standard of care for first-line clear cell RCC for over a decade. So you see here since about 2006, a trial called COMPARES showed that pazopinib, another VEGF receptor TKI, was non-inferior to sunitinib and may possibly have better uh, quality of life and other toxicity profile compared with it. So both of these then became the standard of care. Now, around about in 2017, uh, there started to be a change in this paradigm when first cabozantinib was approved and then that ipilimumab and nivolumab were approved. Um, and so I'm going to show you the two trials that led to the approval, and I want to point out some key features that I think can help us make a, a decision for, for an individual patient. So first, I will talk about the check, Checkmate 214 study design. This was the trial of ipilimumab and nivolumab compared to sunitinib. Again, this was first-line metastatic clear cell RCC. Um, patients were treated until they had progression or unacceptable toxicity, and of course, scans were done to monitor their disease. They were also followed for survival. This study had three co-primary endpoints, and I'm going to show you the first one here. This is the overall response rate in the intermediate and poor risk group only. Now, just as a side note, they did enroll favorable risk patients. They kept that at about 25% of the study. And I've put in boxes here what I think are kind of the key aspects of this overall response rate. So first of all, the overall response rate with the ipinevo immunotherapy combo is higher than with sunitinib. Um, that was highly statistically significant. And importantly, we saw something that we had rarely seen in RCC, which was that a reasonable proportion of patients, 9%, had complete responses compared to only 1% with sunitinib. In terms of the duration of response, if you look up here in the right uh, upper quadrant here, the, the duration of response, so, so that's a measure, again, of how durable the response is, that was not reached, but the lower end of the 95% confidence interval was 21.8 months, um, whereas with sunitinib, the duration of response was about a year and a half. So patients um, in both groups did have ongoing response, and so it'll be interesting to see what this shows in the future in terms of how how long the duration of responses are, um, and specifically in that, that, that complete response group. Some of that data will be actually presented at ESMO. I think the last thing I would want to leave you with is to think about the time to response. And this is shown pretty small here up in the upper left uh, corner. But that's important when the patient sitting in front of me is experiencing symptoms or has a really high burden of disease or fast pace of disease. We want to think about how quick, you know, is this therapy going to work? Now, this is colored by how frequently the scans were done, but at least in this trial, it was about 2.8 months. So what about the other primary endpoints? This is the second one, progression-free survival. Um, this was longer with the immunotherapy combination versus sunitinib, the previous standard of care. So 11.6 versus 8.4 months. Um, also, the overall survival was better with the uh, ipi nevo combo compared with sunitinib, this was highly statistically significant. So I would be remiss if I didn't show you a little bit about adverse events, because I think these do play into our decision making at least a little bit. What's difficult, though, is you know, for the patient sitting in front of me, they may have many of these or, or none of these. But just to show you, a, a, this is a busy slide, so just to point out a few key things. Um, in terms of the grade three to five adverse events with the ipinevo combo. And again, as Dr. Haas mentioned, these are, the, these are the serious events that are requiring intensive treatment, hospitalization, et cetera. The ipinevo had fewer of those, 46% versus 63%. Um, if we look at the, the classic kind of sunitinib and TKI side effects, um, such as fatigue, those tended to be less with the ipinevo combo. Things like uh, diarrhea tended to be less um, and some of the other TKI side effects, which I'll cover in subsequent slides. Now, importantly, in terms of w what we think of our, our uh, immune-mediated adverse events, so the immune system being revved up and attacking the, the patient's normal tissue, um, if you look at any grade adverse events, these range from you know, 1 to about 19%. And reassuringly, the grade 3 to 4 adverse events were, were not that high at about 6%. You know, so you can think of one in 20 patients or a little more having, uh, having a, one of these serious adverse events. 
Now, that said, 60% of the patients on the trial, though, on the ipinevo arm, did require steroids um, for an adverse event. And I'm, for an adverse event, that is. And I'm not showing you this here, but there was a, there was a small number of treatment-related deaths in the ipilimumab nivolumab arm, about seven deaths compared to four deaths with the sunitinib arm. So small numbers, but uh, important to note that, that you know, th that is a risk. So what about quality of life? I mentioned quality of life, and I think this is, this is really interesting to me because I think this is really a way of summarizing how the adverse ev events may affect a given patient. So kind of integrating that fatigue, diarrhea, whatever else they're experiencing. And I think, you know, so not only did ipilimumab and nivolumab beat sunitinib in terms of some of these important cancer control endpoints, it also um, had a better quality of life. So what this is showing you over the over the weeks that the patient w patients were on trial, up to about two years, um, the ipinevo immunotherapy combo is on the top here um, and, and kind of increasing over time, whereas the sunitinib quality of life um, declined initially and then, and then improved somewhat, but still remained separated from the immunotherapy combo. So what about the favorable risk patients? All of the, the data that I was showing you, except for the quality of life, but the tumor control endpoints were really in that group of intermediate and poor risk patients, which was the primary analysis cohort. Well, the favorable risk patients actually had a little bit different outcome, and, and this was somewhat surprising, I think, to people. Um, so in terms of the overall survival, um, the overall survival was actually better for sunitinib. So the way to think about this hazard ratio is the, the overall survival may have been about 45% or 50% worse um, for the ipinevo group. Now this, I would caution you as I note, is based on a small number of events. And when you base these analyses on a small number of events, they're kind of unstable and may change over time. So there were 250 patients, but only 37 deaths. Um, but, you know, interesting, I think. Um, if you looked at the proportions of patients who were alive at 12 and 18 months, it also favored sunitinib. Uh, the overall response rate favored sunitinib and the progression-free survival favored sunitinib. Now, one outlier, though, was the complete response rate. So the complete response rate was higher with ipinevo. So I think a way to think about this is that you, know, you may be less likely to respond with ipinevo, but if you do get a response, you may be more likely to have a complete response. If, if that is the patient's goal, you might take that into, into consideration in your decision making. The other thing to think about with these favorable risk patients is that favorable risk patients may have 12 weeks, 24 weeks to see what happens with ipinevo. If they have a small burden of disease or a slowly progressing burden of disease and things get a little bit worse over 12 or 24 months, it may not be the end of the world. So it may be worth taking that risk. So with the Checkmate 214 study that I've described, I want to kind of compare and contrast that with the Cabo Sun study. Um, this is the second study I'm going to talk about. This was a randomized phase two trial of cabozantinib versus sunitinib. This was a cooperative group trial, again, looking at uh, clear cell component patients who'd had no prior systemic therapy and focusing exclusively on that intermediate and poor risk group. This was only 150 patients as opposed to the more than 1,000 on the last trial. Um, patients were randomized one-to-one -one and followed with, uh, with scans, et cetera. So um, cabozantinib did beat sunitinib in terms of progression-free survival. This is shown here. This is the investigator-assessed version. Uh, it was also confirmed with independent radiographic review. There were uh, more objective responses with cabozantinib than with sunitinib. The response rates were about 46 versus 18 percent. But I'm highlighting here that there were still only about 1 percent of patients that had uh, that those confirmed CRs. Um, on the bottom is showing you the, uh, the response waterfall plots, but I think uh, w one thing that's important to think about is the time to response. And I've highlighted that here. Again, caveat that this is really colored by how frequently you do the scans. We're not doing the scans every day, so we can't pinpoint with accuracy when the patient's responses occur. But at least in the Meteor trial, um, which was a second-line trial, responses with cabozantinib occurred fairly early. And this, this does correlate with my, my clinical response 
during my clinical experience, and when I talk to other clinicians, it does as well. So if we need a response fast, I, I tend to lean more towards cabozantinib, depending on the other factors. Um, overall survival, again, the study was small, not powered for this, but there was at least a trend numerically towards improved survival with cabozantinib with, a, uh, with the number of deaths you see there. Um, what about adverse events and quality of life? Well, this is showing you in the left panel the adverse events with cabozantinib versus sunitinib, and these had the kind of classic VEGF receptor TKI profile of things like fatigue, high blood pressure, diarrhea, increases in some liver function tests, uh, loss of appetite, hand-foot syndrome, um, and uh, loss of taste. Th there were some variations, but they're, they're fairly comparable. I think you can, you can nitpick it a little bit, but keeping in mind it's a small trial. Um, there was an analysis presented at ASCO that showed what's called a Q-twist analysis, and this is a way of looking at quality-adjusted time without symptoms or toxicity. Essentially, it integrates both length and quality of life, and it did show that, that there may be um, you know, better, uh, better control of disease symptoms over time with cabozantinib. There were some limitations to this, though. So to conclude, I just want to go back to this, uh, this analogy here of the duck versus the rabbit. And so I think, you know, for every patient that's sitting in front of me, it's going to be a little bit of a different, a little bit of a different answer, that is. But I have listed some of the factors that go through my mind, and I put a little checkbox by the one that, you know, maybe may tend to be the, more of the right answer. So for that favorable risk patient, I might think more strongly about sunitinib or pazopinib. I don't think cabo, cabozantinib is wrong. Ipinevo could be considered in select patients. For those, those patients who have a high burden of disease, fast pace of disease, or are symptomatic, I'm really thinking more about cabozantinib. Um, doesn't mean it's going to be the right answer in everybody. With patients who have a goal of cure, or what we would think of as a complete response that's durable, um, with a good quality of life, I'm thinking more about the ipilimumab and nivolumab immunotherapy combo. Um, goal to live longer, it, you know, it, it depends, but you know, a, lot of these, a lot of these agents have shown that. It depends, again, on the patient's risk, probably. If the patient isn't an ipinevo candidate, I think I'm thinking more about one of the, one of the TKIs, cabozantinib or sunitinib, pazopinib, and that if the patient isn't a TKI candidate, it's easy. You know, I think ipinevo is, is probably the right answer. So with that, I will close. Thanks so much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>